kind of atmosphere, this thing that I'm going to share with you this morning should be easy for us to do. In Romans chapter 15, verse 1. How many of you came in this morning with a burden upon your heart? Amen. I know there's some that have come in with a burden upon their heart, uh, with troubles in your life. Uh, how many of you this morning, let me twist the question, how many of you this morning came in to help others bear their burdens? Amen. I think that's what we're called to do. If we don't have burdens ourselves, and sometimes we have burdens ourselves and are still called, amen, to help bear the burdens of others. But I want to just talk to you just for a few moments on effective burden bearing. Effective burden bearing. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. If you have it, say amen. The Bible says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Amen. Can I read it again? We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and to not please ourselves let every one of us please his neighbor pay attention to the next few words for his good to edification for even christ pleased not himself but as it is written the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. I want to go back again one more time. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Effective effective you can do something and it not be effective effective burden bearing father we thank you god you've been so good to us this morning god we thank you for your presence we thank you for the holy ghost that has come down upon us and now god we pray just for a few moments god rest your spirit on us once again through the preaching of the word anoint your servant i pray god for the honor of your precious people Lord, we thank you, and we love you, Lord God. Anoint them that we may hear and do what the Spirit is saying to us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and the whole house said, Amen. There are times when we are in so much of a burden and so much of difficulty in our lives that we cannot bear the burden by ourselves. Amen. There are times when we go through stuff. In fact, you would have lost your mind years ago if it had not been, first of all, for the Lord on your side and then for somebody praying for you and bearing your burdens. There are times, as we talked about in Sunday school, where you can't call up a person and you can't get them on the phone, and yet you can call on Jesus, and he's right there. But I thank God also for the times when you can call up somebody in the flesh and you can touch and feel, and you know they're your brother and sister in Christ, and they're willing and able to bear the burden of your soul with you. They may not be able to understand all of the ramifications of what you're going through and all the things uh, that you're dealing with but they're there and thank God that God has put people uh, in, uh, in our places and in, in our way in fact uh, that will help us to bear the burdens that we carry. Amen. How many of you understand that this is not a Lone Ranger job uh, that we have, that Christianity is not just something that we do uh, in the closet? This is why you can't stay home uh, and try to be a Christian. You, you've got to be among the, the body of believers and fellowship uh, around the body of believers because you let the world and life throw you a curveball. Uh, you let them throw you one thing that you can't handle, and I guarantee you, you'll be dying to get in the midst of some fellowship somewhere and believe and trust God because you can't do it by yourself. You can't handle it by yourself. There's no way in the world we can try to handle everything by ourselves. We weren't designed to handle everything by ourselves. This is why the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. 
because man can't handle everything by himself. That's why God made a helpmate come beside him to help him out. Now, I know that's off the subject, but uh, we, 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 we need to understand that, that the, we need each other to help each other and to bear each other and lift each other up. In our times of crisis, there's not anybody that's greater. Can I tell you, infirmity will hit the rich just as quick as it'll hit the poor. It'll hit those that are holy just as much as it'll hit those that are unholy. It'll hit the big and it'll hit the skinny. It'll hit the black and it'll hit the white. It doesn't matter who you are. There is coming a time in your life you'll not escape infirmities. You'll have to have somebody to help you to bear the burden of your soul and of your life. Now watch this. Because Christ is our example. Amen. Christ is, aren't you thankful that Jesus is our burden bearer? That I can look to Jesus and he bears my burdens and he handles my sorrows and he deals with everything in my life. Watch this because this is what Paul says. Even verse 3, he says, For even Christ pleased not himself. And then he goes down and says, For the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. In other words, Christ did not, he didn't come to please himself when he came down to this earth. In fact, he said, I didn't come to be waited on. I came to wait on and I came to serve and help others and bless others. And that's what Jesus does in our lives. He blesses us and helps us and lifts our burdens. And thank God what he's saying there is when we hurt, he hurts. When we cry, he cries. When we feel burden in our life, he feels burden. Watch this. Matthew quotes Isaiah by saying this, that he took our infirmities and he bare our sicknesses. It's a one thing and it's an amazing thing to understand that Jesus takes our infirmities, that he can completely take whatever you're going through and take it out of your life. That God is able to take out of your life everything. Everybody wants him to. You ask one person whether or not they want to go through a storm or a valley or a trial. They'll say no. Everybody wants him to take out the burdens of our soul. But watch what he says. He took our infirmities and then he bare our sickness. In other words, there are times when we have to go through the sorrows and the pain and the sickness and the suffering. But Jesus is there bearing the sickness along with us. He said, I'll not leave you or forsake you. Bless God, he's there right with us. He bears our sorrow and our sickness in times of need. The Bible says in Hebrews that we have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, what touches you touches him. Hello? Now what hurts you hurts him. That what you're crying about, he's crying about. That what you feel, he's already felt, uh, and he's already dealt with at the cross of Calvary. Thank God Almighty, he bore the stripes on his back so that I could be healed. Uh, and bless God, he understands uh, we've got a high priest uh, in the heavenlies that knows our sorrows uh, and our pains. Let me demonstrate. I forgot to bring my little thing out. Let me see one of those offering plates for a minute. That'll work just as good. I'm not taking up a collection. Watch this. In the tabernacle, there was a wood that the tabernacle framework was called acacia wood. Your Bible will say shatim wood. Uh, that's, that's the kind of wood. It was known as an indestructible kind of wood. Yet, when you look at the Ark of the Covenant and all the, especially from the holy place on in, it is layered and I'm pretty sure this ain't real gold. But it's layered with gold. You've got wood wrapped with gold. The wood was symbolic of the humanity of Christ. Because he is able to touch 
the feelings of our infirmities. He's able to feel what you feel and know what you know and hurt when you hurt and cry when you cry. That's the wood. He's the humanity. But the gold is divinity. It's symbolic. Of the, you've got wood that's wrapped in gold. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. He's wood and it's gold. They looked at him and said, this is not a carpenter's son. Is this not wood? And, and yet when they saw him walking on the water, they said, wait, 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 wait. He's got to be gold because he's walking on the water. It confused them. He was wood when he stood at Lazarus' tomb and cried because he identified with the pain. But he was gold when he raised him from the dead and called him out of the grave. He's God. He's wood enough to lay his head on a pillow in the bottom of a boat. But yet, the disciples were amazed because the wood came out as gold and the gold said to the storm, peace, be still. Oh, you don't hear me. God Almighty is able to identify with your pain, but is also able to do something about your sickness and your sorrow and your hurt. He is able to bear our burdens. That, I like this, Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, where it talks about uh, the Bible mentions this sick that there is a sick man. Actually, he's dead. And he's, you remember the story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, where they are carrying him. He's laying in what we, we call a coffin. And he's laying in the coffin. And Jesus comes along. And he's able to touch the dead things. And Jesus, here they are. And the Bible will talk about the fact that they, you know how Paul bearers will bear the body. And they're carrying him to his final resting place. Yet Jesus steps out on the scene. And Jesus talks to the boy, talks to the lad, and says, rise up. And the boy sits up from where he's at. He was dead, but yet he came back alive. But that's not the amazing thing. The Bible says, if you read your Bible, you can get something out of it. The Bible says this, even though they were burying him, Jesus said, in the Bible says, picked him up and delivered him to his mother. Oh, hallelujah. That God Almighty would take me out of the death that I'm in and bring me over into life and give me a new hope and a new peace. Oh, hallelujah. And the Bible says we know not what we ought to pray, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Oh, hallelujah. Let the Holy Ghost come inside of your life. No wonder we need his power to lift up. That Christ is our example, but the Holy Ghost is our enabler. The Holy Ghost is our enabler. Watch this. The Bible says, we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. I'm trying to teach some of you. Let me teach it. We that are strong, ought, the word strong in the Greek language is the same word you get dunamis from. In other words, it's that dynamite power. <laughs> Dynamite's too cheap of a word. It's, it's, it's that nuclear explosive power that God brings inside of your life. Why in the world do we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Bless God, we need to be filled uh, with the power of the Holy Ghost so that God can enable us uh, with some power so that when you're hurting, uh, I can touch heaven uh, for you. That the Holy Ghost enables us it is like the story of when Jesus can, Jesus can draw a crowd. Jesus can draw a crowd. When Jesus comes to town, everybody gathers in one house. And you can't, my God, that wouldn't that be wonderful? 
if we ever realize that the Holy Ghost is in this house and we get the house packed, not because I'm preaching and not because you're singing and not because you're playing, but if, uh, if we just go on the basis that the Holy Ghost is here, my God, we'd pack the house out because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And here they are, crowded, packed out house. And there is a man sick of the palsy. And he cannot get to Jesus. The Bible says because of the press, because of the crowd. Now, for some of you that are not radical in your belief in what God can do, this might blow you away. But some men had the idea huh, that if we can't get through him through the front door, we'll climb up over on top of the house and pull the roof off and let him down that way so he can get to Jesus. My God, isn't that what the Holy Ghost does? When you've got a burden and you can't get to him, the Holy Ghost will empower my life to tear the roof off through intercessory prayer and begin praying in the spirit of the living God so that I can let you down to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. My God, we need to be filled with the power of the Spirit of God to bring people to Jesus. That the Spirit is our enabler. He gives us power when there once was none. And that we ought to be the edifier. Hello? Let me show a few things and I'm going to close. He says, first of all, not pleasing yourself. Go back and look at it. It's in Romans 15.1. Not pleasing. You can't help others if you're pleasing yourself. If, if, this is why I encourage when people come up to pray that after they get through praying, go find somebody else to pray for. Because if all I do is come up and pray for myself, by myself, I have missed the point of divine fellowship with the fellow believers. I could have done that at home. I, I could have done that all by myself, but when I come to the house of God, and once I've gotten things right between me and the Lord, and once I have dealt with some of my problems and my burdens, then it's all right to, to go to somebody who I know's hurting, who I know's got a burden, and begin to pray for them, and to seek the face of God for their life. That we ought to be the edifier. We'll get focused on our problems. It's amazing to me, though, if you begin to look at somebody else's problems, yours will begin to. Because somebody's always got it worse than what you do. How, God, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand the pain, the burden. Wait, 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 wait. We have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He understands and knows the pain that we're going through and the sorrows that we're going through. He understands all of that. And it's all right to pray for ourselves. Don't ever think it's too selfish to pray for yourself. You need to pray for yourself sometime. Just to make sure somebody is praying for you, you need to pray for yourself sometimes. Amen. But once you get through praying for yourself, then you need to understand that my mission and my ministry as a saint of God is to touch God for you and to call out on God for those who are weak. And there again, we ought to cry to an extent when they cry. Amen. We ought to hurt when they hurt. We ought to feel their pain. But at some point in time, somebody's got to come to their senses and speak words of life. Take the word, the book. Don't speak on your opinion and what you know and who lived from it and who died from it. Take the book, bless God, and speak words of life. Take the Bible. 
the word. This is why God gave it to you. Take the word and begin to speak words of life into that person. Like Psalms in 118 where it says, you shall not die, but you shall live and declare the works of the Lord. I know that the faith movement has twisted it and corrupted it, but it's in the book. And if it's in the book, I'll believe it till the day I die that God can heal and deliver. And my God, that's what I ought to be speaking in somebody's life. Because if you can help somebody and encourage them in their faith, they'll believe God and they'll live and not die. They'll believe God and trust and believe. And all we go through the questions, well, my so-and-so had faith and they died. and That's irrelevant and beside the point because everybody is appointed once to die. And then the judgment, nobody escapes death. I don't care if, if you won't, don't want it yourself. At some point in time, you're going to die. That's not the point. Just because people die does not negate the fact that God is still God. That, that, that way when you go to somebody in a hospital or a nursing home, you can encourage them in their faith and you can encourage them in your faith and then you need to encourage them in hope. Bless God, you need to let them know that their hope is not built on the things of this world. It's not built necessarily on the doctors. It's not built on the things of modern medicine. But bless God, my hope is built on Jesus. He's my blessed hope, the Bible says. Hallelujah. That's where my hope is. My hope is not in the sand, but on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. 